Hey guys, today we're going to see how some small mistakes in history led to some pretty big consequences. So strap in with your favorite toothpaste and orange juice because here we go. King of Scots Alexander III was revered by his subjects as a kind and noble king, so he was a pretty cool guy. He put an end to an ongoing war with Norway with the signing of the Treaty of Perth. This stopped the invading Vikings from doing their stereotypical graping and pillaging and made them frig off back to Norway. The treaty also let Scotland gain possession of the Western Isles and the Isle of Man. With all this land expansion going on, as well as increased exports and cash flow, Scotland entered a bit of a golden age. Everything was pretty good until it wasn't. After all, no story is complete without some good old fashioned character development from a Disney Pixar family tragedy. In the mid 1280s, King Alexander's wife, Queen Margaret, bit the dust, which was pretty devastating since they were married since childhood. Well, at least he had his own children to care for. Except for the fact that they all died too. <laughs> Little Margaret Jr., who hilariously became Queen of Norway, expired at the age of 22 while pooping out her only child, a daughter named Margaret. We'll get to her later. Alex Jr. died on his 20th birthday at the age of 20. Don't know how he died either, sources just say he just died. The youngest child, David, also kicked an uneventful bucket at age 19. With his family tree essentially trimmed down to the trunk, Alex was desperate to generate new successors, so he married a French countess, Yolanda of Drew. She moved in with the king, but like in a different town for some reason. Well, one night the king was acting pretty eager to uh, perform, so he set out to do the deed of sowing his seed and nothing was going to block his urge to splurge. Nope, not even that. Despite pleads and warnings from bro code breaking advisors, the king set out to get his dunk sunk. He had a few of his servants accompany him as guides, and they made it to the queen, but the king on the other hand got separated in the harsh storm and was subsequently yeeted off of his horse over a cliff where he was found the next morning, dead as a doornail. With no other heir, it was Margaret Jr. Jr.'s time to shine. But since she was only three years old and with the attention span of a goldfish, the political landscape of Scotland fell into ruin ending the short-lived golden age, all because the king needed to slam some sweet queen skush. As I'm sure you know, the luxurious ocean liner Titanic was the ship of dreams that ended up becoming a complete nightmare. The ship died in 1912 after Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet distracted the two lookouts in the crow's nest from observing the giant fucking iceberg floating several hundred feet in front of them. Despite the crew's best efforts, the ship collided with the iceberg and got flushed into the North Atlantic a few hours later. Joking aside, it is believed that the entire disaster could have been prevented or at least significantly reduced if it weren't for one key mistake, an actual missing key. Lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee were tasked with the important task of making sure that no icebergs were in the ship's path. In the crow's nest, the two men were equipped with a warning bell and a telephone to alert crew of any potential dangers in the chilled waters ahead. They also had one more tool, a pair of binoculars which were secured in a box, a locked box with a missing key. Apparently, this key was accidentally taken off of the ship before it set sail by a second officer, David Blair. What's this, uh, what's this here in my pocket? Huh. Eh, I'm sure that's not a big deal. With no binoculars, the lookouts had to rely on eyesight alone. And that wouldn't be so terrible if it weren't for the fact that the night was extremely dark, cold, and calm, making it very hard to see icebergs. Luckily, there were almost none all night. Almost. Both lookouts miraculously survived the sinking and, when interviewed, agreed that if they had binoculars, they could have seen the iceberg and reacted more quickly, avoiding the unnecessary loss of over 1,500 lives, but dooming James Cameron's film career. The key, donated to the British Sailor Society by Officer Blair's daughter, was eventually sold at auction for 90,000 British pounds. If you've ever dealt with the trouble of remembering how many tablespoons are in a gallon or that there's 660 feet in a furlong, you probably long for the ease of the metric system. Being an American myself, I'm genetically inclined to detest the anti-freedom units, but getting an engineering degree made me appreciate the simplicity of the metric system. I mean, guys, it's, it's, it's really great. Everything is just a multiplicative of 10. Kilogram? It's a thousand grams. A meter? It's a hundred centimeters. Like, wow, amazing. Anyway, that convenience was stolen from us by a band of scallywag pirates during America's infancy. In 1793, Secretary of State Thomas Mother Effin Jefferson recognized that the United States needed to standardize their units of measure as multiple systems were being used, making commercial trading a logistical nightmare. 
Luckily, the French of all people had an answer. Scientist Joseph Dambé was dispatched to the United States with a special gift, a carefully crafted copper cylinder which would serve as the revolutionary new standard in weight measurement, the kilogram. Just one component of France's newly developing metric system. While sailing to the States with his cylinder in one hand and the kilogram in the other, Dambé's ship was blown off course by a storm. <laughs> now headed for the 1700s Caribbean. British pirates at the time usually attacked non-British ships to impede their trade and unfortunately Dambé was one of those victims. He was held hostage for ransom but died in captivity. Dambé's death meant that Jefferson never got the metric standard, meaning it was never adopted. So the United States stuck with the English units as their standard. While it is possible that we could all be measuring our all beef francs using centimeters, it's doubtful as multiple attempts over the years to implement the metric system have been defeated at the greasy hand of American pride. Ethiopia and Italy typically aren't two countries that you would hear about in the same sentence, but during the late 1800s when Africa was getting absolutely reamed by colonization, Italy had its sights set on some potential land expansion candidates, one of them being, you guessed it, Eritrea. Ethiopia's northern neighbor. This led to a bit of an unofficial scuffle called the Italo-Ethiopian War of 1887, which lasted for two years and ended with Italy formally occupying Eritrea and the signing of the Treaty of Wuchal. Among other rules, the treaty basically stated that peace was to remain between Italy and Ethiopia. However, one article had two different meanings between languages. In Italian, the article stated that Ethiopia must act through Italy if they wish to do business with other governments. The Amharic, or Ethiopian version, stated that Ethiopia can act through Italy for external business, which suggested that it wasn't mandatory. Very different things. The treaty was nonetheless signed and eventually the two countries clashed again. Italy claimed that it had full control over Ethiopia's external affairs, but Ethiopia claimed, nah -uh, dude. Italy then invaded Ethiopia in 1895, starting the official first Italo-Ethiopian War. With Italy's army of 44,000 against Ethiopia's 125,000, the Italians ended up getting their spaghetti-eating teeth kicked in, securing Ethiopia's independence in 1896, until Italy invaded again in 1935. Italy won that time. All in all, around 25,000 lives were lost during the first Italo-Ethiopian War, all because Italy decided to skip its daily Duolingo sessions. When you're a power-hungry dictator to millions of food-hungry citizens, your people will probably hate you, which is something that Joseph Stalin was shocked to find out when leading the Soviet Union from 1924 until his death in 1953. Although he came into power with some strong initial support, it quickly dried up as his first few years sucked eggs. He went balls deep into national industrialization and uprooted the agricultural system. No food means famine, and famine means people die. So people died. Millions of them. Stalin was now officially an asshole, and assholes need to be wiped clean. His political rivals demanded his removal, prompting Stalin to switch to defense mode. In doing so, he began stringent investigations of the government for anyone who might even toy with the idea of questioning his policies. Yes, hello, I have question. No one was safe. During what came to be known as the Great Purge between 1936 and 1938, Stalin expanded his investigations to anyone he deemed a threat to the Soviet Union. By the end, there were over 700,000 documented executions of workers, artists, teachers, whoever. While in reality, it is estimated to be about 1.2 million. Even his own Red Army saw 37,000 soldiers executed or sentenced to labor camps. And these weren't just lowly foot soldiers either, I'm talking like commanders and generals, his, his top guys. Stalin was absolutely unhinged with his paranoia destroying his mental and physical health. He ended up surviving a severe heart attack and a stroke in 1945, with his health never fully recovering. On the night of February 28th, 1953, Stalin was chilling with some bros, watching movies and having dinner. After a long night of joking and smooches, Stalin retired to his private quarters, specifically instructing not to be disturbed until he woke up the next morning. Well, the next morning came and nothing. Afternoon, nothing. Remember that even his closest friends were terrified of defying him lest they be sent to the gulag. Night came, still nothing. And by now, they're pretty worried. It wasn't until 11 p.m. that a housekeeper dared to check on Stalin. 
He was found on the ground unconscious and unresponsive. Still terrified to call the doctor, it took another eight hours for Stalin to receive medical attention. With an extremely high blood pressure of 190 over 110, Stalin had suffered another intense stroke. He received around-the-clock care for three days before he ultimately despawned on March 5th, 1953. Had he been kinder to his bros and not such a complete butthole, he may have been treated sooner and survived his ailment, even if it was short-lived. The Soviet Union eventually collapsed in 1991. And there we have it. You can clearly see how small itty bitty mistakes can lead to some severe consequences. So be sure to never make another mistake in your life. You can start that promise by clicking this to check out more of my content. That's never a mistake. I'll see you there.